Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you uh, um, all coming tonight. Uh, I'm getting dozens of texts from people who didn't get in. So while I know it's a little toasty in here, uh, at least you've got chairs. And uh, I hope this next session is as exciting and provocative, honestly, as the first one was. So. Um, So uh, while I'm moving this table, um, I would ask my panelists to introduce Why are you themselves. Why moving the table? So I can read my You're redecorating my the furniture? Jeez, who who are you and guy? what do you do? OK, fine. Uh, God, the hard questions. You start with the hard questions. Hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Reed. I am the Global Chief Media Officer for General Motors. I'm Dan Gardner. I'm co-founder and executive chair of Code & Theory, a Stagwell company. I'm Will Doherty. I'm the Vice President of Inventory Development for the Trade Desk. Hi, everyone. I'm Tara Carraro, Chief Communications Officer for U.S. Steel. All right, so we're going to dive right in. And, uh, you know, this panel is going to focus more on the commercial aspect of news. And um, we really want to get into what behaviors are going to change, particularly on the advertising side, with the release of research this like this, which fundamentally debunks the need for keyword blocking at a certain level, right? You know, we now have advertisers that we're seeing at Advantes Media that have 16,000 keywords that they're blocking. That's an actual number. Uh, and, you know, that was all done in the spirit of safety when we didn't have the data. Well, we've now got the data. So um, I'll start with uh, Shannon to my left. Uh, you've always been a proponent of news, uh, regardless of where you were working. Uh, now that you're at General Motors, I know uh, both on a local and a national level you use news. Um, I assume this study is tailwind for the work that you do, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely it's tailwind. I think it's it's really interesting to, to see some of those numbers side by side, right? And I want to dig even deeper into um, some of the results that, that we saw today, um, because I think it debunks a lot of the assumptions that uh, are leadership might have, I'm not talking about General Motors in particular, I'm talking about all of the brands that I've worked on over the course of my career, because I've worked on brands who have struggled with what to do. Um, do we advertise in this space? Do we not advertise in this space? What's the right approach to being in this space? Do I keep it fair and balanced? Do I invest in both directions? Where do I go? Um, and I think there's a lot of fear and a lot of misinformation in um, what they can and could be doing in this space, and it's why we had uh, tools pop up that allowed us to just block it and stay safe. Uh, and so I think this kind of tailwind about it doesn't change the performance. And I think it tells us that we have underestimated the intelligence of the American consumer as it relates to the media, advertising, and the content, not necessarily being a sponsor of the news, but a supporter of the news. It doesn't mean that we're bringing you, a, it's not doesn't mean we're sponsoring a war, right? And that was the Applebee's problem that, that we had a few years back, which started a lot of anybody doesn't remember the Applebee's story. It was an unfortunate CNN moment with a picture in picture just as the Ukraine uh, war was breaking out and Applebee's ran a, uh, as part of their ad buy and it wasn't intentional. It's not like somebody at Applebee's said, oh, right now, go run an ad. That's not how advertising works. Uh, and so- And the actress in the commercial was twerking towards the camera. It was just an unfortunate moment. It was moment. an unfortunate moment. And you know, look, I, I don't necessarily blame CNN either. It was part of a machine of how this stuff gets put into the, into the ecosystem. And in an ideal world, somebody would have had the forethought to say, hey, this isn't a moment to run ads. Let's step back. Um, but we need, we need help getting to that, to that space. That's great. Uh, and Tara, um, as someone who is a, uh, represents a company that is a stalwart supporter of news, I see your ads in the Wall Street Journal all the time. Um, how is this study going to be useful to you, with your colleagues? As a, you know, validation point, uh, will it you know cause you to think about even doing more news? Tell us a little bit about how you're building the brand amidst a little bit of you know uh, news in the marketplace. Sure. So if you take a step back, I took the role about two years ago, and the CEO challenged us to decommoditize and differentiate U.S. Steel and its products. And so one of the ways we've gone about doing that is putting together, I think, a very strong thought leadership platform. And news provides the perfect outlet for that. So we've worked with Axios and Reuters and WAPO and The Times and The Journal and The Hill and Politico and Techonomy and so on and so forth, but not just you know, placing ads. We, you know, working with newsletters and homepage takeovers and events. And so it's across the ecosystem of the various platforms 
that news provides for us. And uh, we're seeing, I think, a few advantages. So newsletters are working really well for us in particular. Um, they have the contextualization that gets you to an audience that's very interested in the specific topic that you're focused on. So a great example for us is Axios Generate. We had the top performing piece of content in Axios Generate in 2023. In fact, we had three of the top 10 best for performing pieces of content, and we had the second highest piece of content in Axios Macro. And so those are providing a really strong uh, opportunity for us to get our message across. And, and I, I pulled some, some data that I just want to share. So we did a reputation benchmark study in July of last year, and we just did our pulse at the end of March, beginning of April. And we are up two points with opinion elites, up a point with media, up five with customers, up almost two with policy influencers. And when you ask the question, you know, is this a company I trust? The scores range from 87.5 to 92.1. So it's working. That is really well done. I think that's a key point though. You, you really, in my own personal experience, when you treat news publishers as partners and you engage them directly and you co-create, you know, advertorial-like content but with editorial-like quality about topics that matter to create context for you to then run your ads in, that's better. And I have more than a few mentors in the room, Phil, I'm looking at you, who taught me that trick. And like, go meet with the news publishers. Don't like outsource that one to the agency. Make sure you have a relationship. So, Will, that kind of brings us to you. Uh, you sit on top of the largest demand side platform in the world, not owned by Google, and you see the marketplace demand. You have a CEO in Jeff Green who is absolutely obsessed about supporting news journalism, and I wish he had more peers that shared that mission. Are you seeing a shift in the marketplace? Are you seeing more advertisers like uh, Shannon and Tara who are you know, leaning in to the news and, and seeing the business benefit? We are. I mean, there's, there's a no, you few... You can stop there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, there, there's a few things. Like, uh, because sometimes it's a, it, we paint like a very bleak picture uh, of news and journalism. And there's a few things to note. Um, from a consumption standpoint, news seems to be doing really well. Like, there's a ton of consumer demand. We see it on the other end. What we haven't seen is monetization match the consumer demand for the news that we see. And, and one of the artifacts of just how the systems were built was that we, we did a really bad job in the early days making uh, platforms, even like ours, publisher-centric. Uh, inventory became just sort of a very broad brush. I'm, I have my audience, I've picked it out, I've set frequency caps, I've got a bidding strategy and I'll let the machines take it from here. And where are those ads gonna run? Somewhere. And we started to orient people around the pipes and not publishers. And the consequences of those decisions happen much later when someone doesn't like that their ad was adjacent to something. So what's a really easy thing to do? I'll just add a keyword. And I say that to mean that we made it extraordinarily easy to do the wrong thing and hard to do the right thing. We didn't present the trade-offs to our clients in the right way so they understood the consequences of those decisions. So a lot of the work that we're doing today is to help, I would say, reestablish the value exchange that news has in every media plan and making it much easier for our clients, our partners, to uh, do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Can I, I, can I mean? Shannon, <laughs> you don't need to ask permission. All right, fine. Uh, all right, if I can build on that, because you, you're doing some really interesting things, and I think you're absolutely right. The We set the audiences, and we said, go find us these audiences. And the machine said, and not just yours, all of the machines said, find it for the cheapest rate with the most reach, and that went to the biggest platforms and the biggest sites and the biggest partners first. And so that's where you got your volume, and then it started to fill in everything else. And as you and I were talking about this before, one of the things that I think we all hope to accomplish, I know you hope to accomplish, with this topic of supporting journalism and supporting news is really getting it into being the same conversation that we're having about supporting diverse-owned media partners. And the changes that I know the Trade Desk is making is giving us the opportunity to focus our dollars there first. How do we go and make sure that we get that harder-to-reach reach 
first and then fill in with the mass media. Um, and I think it changes the entire game. I think it creates an incredible opportunity for us to make sure through partners uh, where we're doing programmatic media buying, which doesn't always solve the problem, in all fairness, because not all of the dollars that we spend with you make it to the platform, right? Well, you, with you, they do. With the, some of the partners, it doesn't. Uh, depends on where the supply side's coming from. But we want to make sure that as much of the dollars ultimately get it to, to the partner at the end of the day. Yeah, to put a fine point on that, when Mark was presenting the study, uh, there was a slide where it showed that 11% of the population or the 50,000 people in the study were s exclusively news junkies. And, and I said to Shannon, she was sitting next to me in the front row, and I said, how excited would you be if you got 11% incremental unduplicated reach in terms of driving growth, and you can. I just want everybody in this room to buy a new car. That's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> yeah. We can you do that. You buy a car, and you buy a car. You buy <laughs> Not a car. Not giving away cars, but yeah, I am happy to offer my friends and family discounts. So. Yeah. Um, so Dan Garner, you've been waiting there patiently. You bring a very interesting perspective to this conversation. I was not aware of some of the design zeitgeist that code and theory brings to the marketplace. Your teams have now re-engineered 150 newsrooms worldwide, most recently uh, Reuters, and, and really bringing them into the 21st century in terms of, you know, workflow and you know the the what we need to do to be efficient. What are the KPIs there that the news industry is building towards that you're then interpreting into how you set up a newsroom? Yeah, I think it's important. I'm going to just go back in history because I think it's, it kind of contextualizes everything. If you think about it, around 2008, the traditional media landscape totally collapsed. And that was the moment where everybody said, OK, I have to move to digital. And I'm going to say use digital in quotes because it doesn't mean anything to anybody. Or I'm going to die. And while that happened, what you had a couple digital upstart media companies that had a very, at the time, unique approach to delivering content, which was really an arbitrage game. It wasn't build a brand game, it was an arbitrage game. It was an arbitrage and they figured out first how to find audience. And they figured out how I can use social or SEO or other mechanics to find audience and then sell against that audience. Their priority and KPIs, it's interesting you asked that question, was not like what is the best journalism? How do I best inform citizens? How do I do the right thing? That was not the goal, it was simply arbitrage. And then what followed after that was the media landscape around them got actually more sophisticated. And everybody realized, oh, I can do similar techniques and I can find audience. Then what happened after that was there were businesses that formed from it to say, I could actually operationalize the little systems that actually make it better for the media landscape to be more effective. And there became all this SaaS software across everything from analytics to like whatever you want to do, there was a piece of software which means it democratized the ability to find audience. Then what happened was algorithms start to change and even the algorithms got more specific and that started, that started to put the crack in what happened. Then social media became even more dominant and their algorithms got better where it stopped even having the need to follow through to the engagements. So the backdrop of this entire history was that media publishers, and I'm gonna I say that in a broad scope, the ones now that we're seeing the problems, didn't define their brands and didn't define the values to which they are going to communicate their stories and why they actually exist. So when it came time to be, create meaning behind the brand, it, didn't, it wasn't there. It was absent. So now the KPIs are how do we actually drive value specifically to the audience the way any brand derives value, whether you sell cars or whether you're a CPG company. They are thinking in terms of that of like, my brand should mean something, my brand should have equity, and I should be able to con connect with an audience or a community in a way that actually has value. We now, from the study, see that there's no safety issues, so that value means something. So brands now, as they, let's say we're going through this new transformational moment similar to 2008, they're recalibrating to get back to some of the basics because the tools exist, it's not a tool thing anymore, it's back to the basics, to good reporting, a brand that means something, an audience that actually, can, they can deliver that value to, and then monet the monetization part is revolving around that, which creates a lot of untapped opportunity. When I say a lot, a tremendous amount. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's an interesting dynamic that I've experienced too. Like, who owns the relationship with the news publisher? You know, I was 35 years a client at E&J Gallo, American Express, and Bank of America most recently. And increasingly in later years, particularly after the George Floyd incident, corporate communications kind of came in like Al Haig when President Reagan was in the air, for those five of you in the room who remember that, and said, I'm in charge. And all of a sudden, I'm going through corporate communications to talk to someone I was working with for 25 years. Don't knock corporate communications. Wow. Well done. Wow. Well done. Just a general observation, not. Anyhow. Uh, so I do think, though, I think we all need to assert ourselves and reestablish direct relationships with publishers, at least, at least some news publishers that are you know, geographically easy to access and willing to talk to you about what you can build together collaboratively. Uh, but uh, Shannon, I want to turn to you uh, and ask you in your experience, um, what are the kinds of items that typically come up in internal conversations around news? Uh, yeah. what, what do your colleagues hope for, fear, push you to do? Uh, and I would include, you know, as we're going to talk about local in a minute, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear about you know, your, how you're involved with the dealer networks and that topic too. Yeah, so I, th I think it's interesting, and it's not even just, again, not just at General Motors. I'm going to caveat everything I say by saying, I've been at General Motors about 100 days, so um, I do not want to speak for the entire, entire organization, uh, and I do have an amazing comms team um, behind me, which is, is phenomenal. I, look, the, the conversations I've had with clients and inside brands over the years have been around uh, the challenges of it, news is divisive. We don't want to look like we're sponsoring something uh, that's terrible that's happening in the world. World. Things that this study disproved. A consumer is not in the right mindset when they see our ad next to this thing. Now, look, I could argue that that same thing is true if I'm showing you, you know, a beautiful Cadillac. I'm heart and soul the Cadillac buyer, right? I sit dead center in our Cadillac Target, um, and it's they're beautiful vehicles, by the way, um, but, and fun to drive. She's got um, an offer in her pocket. That yeah, she can... that's another story. Anyway, the but the. Um, but if I'm seeing a Cadillac ad at a time when I'm trying to figure out why my dog is vomiting a certain color, that's probably not the moment that I'm in the mindset to actually think about buying a Cadillac. And so I still would count that as a wasted impression, right? Um, and so I think there's a fine line to draw. And I think the conversations with, with communications, and I do think you're right, communications came in and, and you know, the people who are in charge of managing PR had a fear of like, what is our corporate reputation? And I think it's a completely legit legitimate fear. What's our corporate reputation if we look like we're in these places? I think marketers came in and said, is this really right for my brand? Um, and is this an impression that's actually gonna get me the, the value that I want? Um, and so I think there's, and then there's the polarization topic of do we look like we're supporting one side more than we're supporting the other. And so my advice to all of my clients and, and even inside General Motors was you need to figure out what you stand for in this space. And we talked about this a little bit. Like I think there's an opportunity to say, hey, I had one client who said, we're just gonna balance our media investment on what appears to be both sides of the aisle. And so everybody's gonna get equal investment, we're just gonna call it a day. And so nobody can accuse us of being one side or the other, we're just gonna be out there. Um, and there's companies like General Motors who like, from a polarization perspective, our products are planned seven, 10 plus years in advance. So whatever the politics are of today, we are gonna continue to work with every administration that comes in and out of that office uh, or in and out of those offices over time. Um, and so the polarization is less of an issue for us. It's more of how do we continue to work with the, the partners along the way. Wow, there's a lot there. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about how to balance the bias, uh, that's what Adfontes Media does, and Vanessa Otero right here can tell us, uh, can tell you later at Cocktails about how to balance your bias and reliability and reach the audience the way you want to. Uh, Tara, as someone I just, uh, you know, uh, so besmirched your approach and profession. Of no. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd like to give you an open mic to respond. So we don't have a classic marketing team at U.S. Steel, so I tell people I'm a communications person masquerading as a marketer. Like the lines are blurred and we have to be able to to move back and forth and use news effectively not only to help promote a strong corporate brand, but we also use it to sell product as well. Like one of our most successful performing pieces of content in, in Axios in the last month has been about Coastaloom. So if you're in a market for a steel roof after you buy a car, I'm your girl, um, you know, and so you you can use it, you know, in a way that is is safe 
and it is effective. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know, you know, look, 10, 15 years ago, it was church and state and marketing and comms didn't talk to each other and we probably didn't even like each other. And now the lines are so blurred that, um, you know, I think that uh, you just, you can't help but, but work together and, and figure it out. All right, well, coming back to you now, um, you know, I've had the privilege of being a little bit inside on the S&P 500 plus build out that you're um, executing. And it's really amazing to see how important news is in that product. And I think it's almost going to be unavoidable for those people who are, you know, go to market strictly programmatically. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot that won't be able to go have a relationship with a publisher. And they're just simply looking at the marketplace as a commoditized market, uh, which is unfortunate because, uh, we, you know, standardization is good and has been a necessary thing. And those of us who've been in media our whole lives have spent a lot of time trying to create standards. Uh, but standardization in this case has led to actual commoditization. And high quality inventory is conflated with low quality inventory and away we go. But well, my question for you is, I know this is mission driven for trade desk with news, but is there real commercial opportunity? Do we think the world will come back to seeing news as, you know, uh, to put it in perspective, a recent study of the top 200 publishers in programmatic who make up like 95% of the inventory, they rep represent 23% of programmatic inventory but slightly less than half that in terms of programmatic revenue. So it's being sold at a massive discount, yet it's being, you know, it delivers this incredibly rich, valuable audience. Is there commercial opportunity there, or is this just a labor of love for you? Um, it started as, it, it is a commercial opportunity. I, I'd say the, the fact that we get to do good while we're building good commercial products is a bonus. Um, this really started with uh, a recognition that over the last couple of years, we were watching the supply chain change quite a bit, and not always for the better. And so we were seeing more and more dilutive content uh, make its way into the bid stream. And so uh, easy way to think about this now, just because it's uh, sort of the topic du jour, is MFA, or made for arbitrage, made for advertising content, which is, uh, you know, abusive ad experiences, high ad refresh, and very low quality content experiences. Uh, they often had very benign and, and sort of, uh, uh, you know, seemingly pleasant domain names, or even in some cases using a lot of heritage uh, uh, and established brands to kind of enter into the bid stream. And, and we, we, we saw the problem early on and, and we realized blocking it was not enough that we had to reorient the buyer experience to something that, you know, to my earlier point, was much more publisher-centric. And if we, as we started to come up with the principles in terms of how do we better define the open internet and the publishers that make up the open internet, where do we start? Well, let's start with original content, professionally produced original content. And when you start there, the most evergreen source of original, professionally produced content is news and journalism. And we believe that if we could pull that front and center and we could make that obvious, impossible to ignore, then the investment would follow. Um, and that would also allow us to fulfill our mission, which is making sure our marketer's investment was going to high quality, impactful experiences that would drive results for their brand. We couldn't do it without it. If their uh, investment continued to be diluted by lower and lower quality experiences, we saw that as an existential threat. When we look at products like Pmax or Advantage Plus, that are just uh, black boxes inside of a black box where there is zero transparency, publishers play no role. We think of them as extraordinarily cynical products and anti-publisher products. And so we had an opportunity to contrast that direction with something that we thought would be better, not only provide commercial value for the trade desk, but also a lot of value for our marketers. That's a great answer. Um, anybody want to add into that? Yeah. Well, the, the thing I just want to add is, I think um, when thinking about advertising across digital platforms, 
it gets deduced down to just simply display advertising that is being flighted across a landscape of, you know, a fragmented landscape. And um, the reason I said, you know, digital in quotes before is because digital in quotes, the way most of that advertising is just content being thrown up on a screen in a square somewhere. And uh, as the that, sort of That's not fair. Sometimes it's a rectangle. Exactly. Sometimes it has a window that like opens up. I get it. We, we really evolved a lot um, in the last two decades. But, but I think, you know, joking aside, is like that is a huge opportunity. I mean, the, the amount of content, you know, we were talking about this not too earlier, it's just increasing and increasing and increasing. Then one could add, uh, make the argument that quality content is, becomes more and more valuable. But on top of that becomes quality to experience. And the thing that digital does is it allows you to experience things. It's behavioral, not just like, you know, information. Um, and uh, I personally believe actually that the internet is moving from what I call the IQ, like information superhighway, to have EQ built into it, where there can actually be emotional connections. Um, I think actually news does that inherently. Um, so the news landscape has an advantage to that. So. As a brand, there is huge opportunity, huge opportunity to do something unique in a world where it's harder and harder to do uni something unique. And as I said before, brands and publishers are actually aligned. They're trying to do the same thing. And what publishers don't have is the resources to do some of the unique things that they uniquely have the ability to do, whether it's a type of journalism or a type of interaction that sits above that. So for example, the elections are coming up, like data and interaction and understanding that. Um, is very unique and not every medium publisher has the resources that CNN or NBC has to do that that could be very valuable to a very engaged audience that is incredibly important that's similar to the Axios newsletter that actually meant something because it was a little different product than just flighting display ads. You can find opportunities working with publishers to do incredibly, incredibly cool things that will actually be meaningful in ways that just a display ad or a pre-roll just will not be able to get. Meaningful to, to your brand and also meaningful to the consumer. Exactly. And I hope you're right about the EQ. I really do, because I would love to see that be true. You just reminded me, I have a friend in the audience who I haven't seen in a long time, uh, and we worked together. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story. I hope I don't embarrass anybody. Um, tw close to 15, maybe close to 20 years ago, probably closer to 20 right. years ago, right out of college. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, not, not far off, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> But close to 20 years ago, I'm going to pick on the Washington Post for a second. The Washington Post came in to sell me digital advertising on Washington Post Newsweek Interactive, if anybody remembers that collection of sites. Um, and uh, I was like, that's cool. Um, but I run the advertising for Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus was my client at the time. And uh, I said, we're not going to advertise around news. It's, we're not going to sell you know, Dior dresses at the same time that we're uh, advertising around news. But you have a tremendous amount of lifestyle content that's happening in the DC area. Like really incredible stories about the parties and the events and these really cool things that are happening. If you build a channel on the site that gives me that content, I will sponsor that. And we did all day long, highest return on investment. So that partnership, that like, and look, it wasn't creative, I'll tell you that. It was, you know, 468 by 60s and 728 by 90s. And we're really excited when we got a 160 by 600, right? Um, so like, but that was inventive for the time. And I just, I think those opportunities get pushed by the wayside when we don't take the time to step back and actually have a conversation with the partner and say, what do we do together that can be interesting that maybe five years from now goes into the programmatic exchange because then it becomes part of the ecosystem. But today is something unique and really interesting that we can co-create. Yeah, and I would like to just add to that, Instagram will not do that partnership with you as a brand. They just will not. They will not go to the depth that a news or media company will do. They just won't. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious of the walled gardens and their support of news. They seem to be doing more globally to uh, either steal the revenue or block the distribution, which does not bode well. Um, but I, I, I do want to pick up on that theme. You know, even if you're in a situation where your company, your risk committee, your CEO does want to advertise in news, something like Shannon just talked about, I remember with uh, Bloomberg Media, Anthony sitting right there at the time, we created something, uh, we partnered with them on a new product, which was called TikTok. That's how long ago it was. It had <laughs> nothing to do with TikTok. 
And we debuted it in the uh, World Economic Forum, and it was wildly successful. And we were able to put money on the platform, not that Bloomberg needed it, but my point is you can build non-news revenue sources with news partners and support journalism that way and stay away from news if that's the constraint you're under. Again, you've heard it six times from this uh, panel, partnership. Partnership begins with outreach. Partnership which begins with being accessible and taking that call and not sloughing it off with all the other vendors because you're inundated in your inboxes. We all have been, you know, oh, that's a news platform that I care about. Maybe I'll take that call. Maybe I'll ask my agency to introduce me to the publisher. Maybe I'll do something to, to advance the I think, cause. I think partnership just begins with Anthony because we're talking about the same person. Yeah. Oh, really? Is, are yeah. you mm -hmm. oh. Oh. And just So I, you, re, you resold me an idea that you created with Shannon. See me, see me after class. <laughs> I just have a, a, a more a recent example where we've done that. So uh, politics, as discussed historically up until this moment, uh, has been hard to advertise on. And we worked with Real Clear Politics to launch RealClearPolls.com because it was blacklisted on on a lot of sites. And that's just facts. It's just polls that aggregated that could say whatever. And you and we're going into an election year where there's going to be a lot of eyeballs and a lot of attention on what's going on in the election. People more and more want to understand data. So that's a good example of a media publisher finding an opportunity to create, even if you're a little nervous still, and you're like, you, you hear the study, and you're like, let me enter into it. There are opportunities across the landscape where you can still get the eyeballs without, you know, and dip, yeah, dip your toe into it. Brilliant idea, brilliant idea. All right, I want to make sure that, uh, A, we leave a little bit of time for questions at the end from the audience, but B, we need to talk a little bit about local journalism. Local journalism in this country is dying. 25% of the news platforms that existed eight years, nine years ago now, um, are gone. Of the remainder, uh, the vast majority have moved from a daily publishing cadence to a weekly publishing cadence. This is how the gerrymandering starts. This is why you're seeing the polarization in Congress. Um, we're, we're now creating districts where it's impossible to vote anything other than hard left or hard right because these districts look like a string bean that's been put in through, you know, uh, put in through a bench press. Uh, and at the same time, when you talk to the local publishers, and I've spent a lot of time in the last year as part of what we do at Ad Fontes, talking to them, they say, we never get access to agencies. We don't have a programmatic tech stack because we can't afford to build it. They're going to the local plant manager for a, you know, a national advertiser and seeing if she or he can help him you know, or get, get some ad dollars going. And we, ha we have to create new pathways. They really don't have a programmatic tech stack. And while everything is not display, 94% of all display media last year was trafficked programmatically, and that's the bread and butter for local publishers. And they don't have a tech stack, so they're competing for the other 6%. That doesn't bode well. And so I don't know what can be done. I'm going to start with the marketers in the room. Tara, you seem to local Local news is critical for us, absolutely critical. Uh, you know, we operate in about eight key states, and we rely on the goodwill of those communities to be able to continue to operate. So you've heard of social license to operate. It's pretty status quo. We talk about social license to grow. So what do we need the communities to know, think, and feel about U.S. Steel? So we buy local TV, we buy local print, we buy local radio, we develop partnerships, and again, it works. So if we go back to that same study that I referenced earlier, and we look at some key brand metrics, the, you know, we're up in every single state we operate in on those who believe that we operate in an environmentally friendly way. We're up in every single state but one on those who believe we're striving to be more sustainable. And we're up in every single state except for one on those who believe that we support causes that they care about. Can, Can I put you in a spot? Is it a lot more work? I think there's a theory it's no. a lot more work. So, and we, we work with a, an extremely small agency based in Washington, D.C., but we are the ones having those conversations. So the, myself and the people on my team, we have the conversations. And then 
we go to the agency for the creative development and, and the buys, but we're the ones having those initial conversations. That's great, that's very leaned in. Shannon, anything you're doing? Yeah, here? I mean, the, it, anybody who's worked in auto will understand that there's a complication between what happens in tier one media, which is your national media, the tier two, which is your local marketing associations, which dealers participate in, and then the tier three, which is the dealers themselves. Um, for, the te for the dealers themselves and the local marketing associations who we partner very closely with across the channel, Channels, um, local is is hugely important, right? This is the this is where the local uh, partnership that a dealer has that is sponsoring the local baseball game that is getting covered by the local news with a reporter that actually understands their business that is covering their sale that is covering uh, the good that they're doing in their communities. It's it's super important, and it's also where consumers. I think we all know, believe that they get the things that connect most directly to their lives. And so the trust that is automatically uh, shared in that moment of, oh, but this is Pepe Cadillac in Westchester, and so I know who Pepe Cadillac is. <laughs> Sporting Cadillac, uh, <laughs> then there's this opportunity to say, I'm gonna make this full circle connection and Pepe sponsored this, Pepe's in my local newspaper, Pepe's on my local news channel and I'm, I'm getting the latest news and it's brought to you by Pepe, I wanna continue to support Pepe. So our dealers do a tremendous amount in that space, we support them doing a tremendous amount in that space and part of my job now, which is a little different than, than a role that General Motors has ever had in the past, is try to connect all of those tiers so that we can make sure that when we are speaking to consumers, we're not over in them and actually giving the dealers more opportunity to do more in their local markets because they don't need uh, the support of the national piece is already there for them. 30 years and we're still sitting on panels discussing uh, global frequency capping. Oh my God. Uh, it's, it's been, that's... gentlemen, anything you wanna add on the local front? I'll just add that um, there's uh, you can't have a panel without talking about AI, so I'm going to bring a little AI into this. We almost made it. Um, the the problem from a brand perspective, or the challenge, I should say, is is expensive. What you want to do as an advertiser is you want to be personal. We've been talking about personalization forever, um, and you want to align with the local you know brands or media companies because that is a bit more personal, as you said. The problem is it's expensive to create scaled content at the personal level. And this is an obvious area on the, let's call it the lower content supply chain of making advertising and making communication that is lower than the biggest idea but actually gets to the, the nuance of a local market. So if you have the confidence and ability to create content at scale more effectively, you could actually advertise more easily and get the results probably better than you would have in just hitting the same audience on Instagram. So I, I think this is a positive part to the creative process that actually can help that. That's great. This is probably one of the harder ones. Um, but I, I do think part of the way I see the supply chain changing is that uh, it, at this point in time, supply is virtually unlimited. It's infinity. Um, it's what our platform experiences every day. There is orders of magnitude more supply than there is demand. Uh, if we were so inclined and we didn't care about global frequency capping, we could exhaust the, the entire budget for all our marketers at scale in probably the first six minutes of every day. Yeah. But we always frequency cap. Um, wow. Budgeting and pacing, big part of it. Um, and so, but. I, I think there's been so much excess, and, and, and in the same way that, uh, uh, you know, with any kind of inflationary uh, behavior, where the only way out is if I just print more, uh, we're seeing news publications, but supply in general say, all right, well, it's more competitive now. There's more supply, so what's the best solution? Let's make more of it. And, and that's kind of compounded the issue, and I think local gets drowned out in that noise quite a bit. and I. I think one thing that we're starting to realize, and maybe we always knew intuitively, but we can prove more, is that bigger is not always better, and that uh, in an impression is not an impression. And I think that we've trained the market incorrectly over the last two decades to say one impression is worth the same. This show on Max or this show on Netflix is worth the same as this cat video. We don't think that's true. 
We don't think the value of content itself um, is appropriately represented, I would say, within the ecosystem today. So part of it is how do we uh, make inventory uh, uh, more publisher-centric, but then how do we also value rich content that has very good ad experiences that lead to results? If it's just a tonnage game, I don't know how local competes. Um, but I do think we've, the excess has gone so far that we're seeing organic constraints come in and we're seeing supply somewhat recede. We're seeing the denominator shrink from something like infinity to something much more negotiable. When that happens, I do think local can kind of stand on its own two feet. But you know, there's a lot of macro that has to happen for that to be true. But if you go, if you go back to the study and we look at the, those little boxes and getting to that like really core customer that is so unique in this space, that news junkie person is so unique and they're so hard to reach in other places. I do go back to, is this the opportunity to say, start my media there, yes. fill in everybody else? Because that's where I get incremental reach from and I wanna start with my incremental and build the mass backwards. That's a really great takeaway from a planning standpoint. Really start with the hardest people to reach that are the best you know, potential customers. So we saved about four minutes for questions, otherwise I've got more, but I'd love to see anyone, actually, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna put somebody in a spot. Uh, we're very lucky tonight be joined, to be joined by Dean Mark Lukashevitz from uh, Hofstra University School of Communications, former NBC bigwig who went into academia and is a huge fan of quality news journalism. I'd like to ask you to ask a question. Anthony, if you'll pass the mic. Your check's in the mail, Lou, thank you. Um, I actually have two questions, but I'm, but I'm gonna put you on the spot because I want you to take a stab at answering uh, one of them. First thing is, um, I did work at NBC, ABC for a lot of years. I'm curious that I've heard a lot of Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Bloomberg, New York Times, haven't heard NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox. I think those 11% of news junkies spend their evenings Absolutely. in one fact universe over at Fox News or in an entirely different fact universe at MSNBC. And a lot of that work, I think, I would even say doesn't really qualify as journalism anymore. Mm. Uh, so is that news in your view? Yeah. The second thing uh, really struck a chord with me in the earlier panel talking about the loss of trust in institutions, um, which I think we're all seeing. I think a lot of us look at that and realize that there are interests globally and interests domestically with increasing power who have an interest in destroying trust in institutions of all kinds. The media and journalism being one of those institutions. And I wanted to ask all of you whether you feel you have a responsibility as you provide a lot of the financial underpinning of journalism, not only to place your money in journalistic institutions, but to stand up for the institution of journalism as an institution. And do, is that a responsibility you're willing to take on? Can, can I just ask the audience, just, these answers will be more candid if we all agree that they'll be off the record. Thank you, Mark. Are we off the record with those cameras? Um, no, that's a good point. All right, there's cameras rolling, <laughs> so. Thank you, Mark, you're a good sport, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, so, the responsibility of the organization, I can't speak to. I can speak to my own personal responsibility and the responsibility that I carry as a, as a marketer to try and lead my organization to the places that I think are best, not just for our business, but where I think our consumers are and what I think is the right thing to do. And I've, I've said a few times in, in my opportunities to speak publicly that I wanna make sure that the businesses that I work for stay on the right side of history. Um, and if I do that by making sure that we support journalism, I'm gonna, I'm gonna champion those causes inside my organization. The overall responsibility of the organization isn't something that I can necessarily speak to. What was the first question? Uh, uh, cable news. Cable news, yeah. So, and is it really news? Um, I will tell you we perceive it as news. So as it gets keyword targeted or blocked, et cetera, yes, we look at all of the, the video channels, whether they're streaming or, or direct uh, or cable. Uh, or linear the same way. We look at them as news channels um, and they get blocked and or allowed in, in those same ways. And I, the CNN example is you know, the perfect moment of like, oh no, is this something we do or we don't do? And I do think when I was talking at least about whether or not you choose to run on 
uh, what would be perceived right or what would be perceived left or what might be perceived center is there really any center left. Um, the, um, the challenge uh, for a marketer is to figure out, do you go with a fair and balanced approach to that investment? Um, or do you choose to go one direction or, or the other? And I think that's, a, that's something the marketer and the brand need to come to a decision on and then stick to it. Like put a stake in the ground and, and own it because it makes it easier to communicate back to the media sellers. This is how we approach news. Figure it out, stitch it in an Etsy pillow and call it a day. <laughs> so I guess uh, I'll answer it first that um, I'm fortunate enough to uh, have founded my company 23 years ago and been part of the news journey all along the way. It's been a passion of mine. It's something that I deeply care about. I've worked in you know, hundreds of newsrooms from inside out. I've spoken with thousands of journalists that have feel very passionate about what their job is. Um, so it's something I believe in and that's kind of why we've been in the space, to be honest, trying to solve the commercial um, problem around the fiduciary um, sort of purpose that they all serve. I think uh, I, I work with a lot of those broadcast companies that you talk about as well. So when I say news, it, it's really every, it's everything from s s small publishers to big broadcast companies. And um, I, I don't see how you could not define Fox or NBC as not news. I mean, we, you could argue maybe their bias is more strong, but if I think if you were to actually measure uh, for hun over 100 years, you'd find bias in news. That is actually a fact. Um, not saying it's always purposeful, but it is a fact. And just to, because there's some subjective extreme version of bias doesn't necessarily not make it news. It's still news, it still serves a purpose. I think to the local news conversation we were having earlier, that local news is actually even more trusted. That's the person who shows up at my dealership to have a conversation with me about what I'm doing and that the, the person that I feel like I have a relationship with. And it's why I'm obsessed with Tamsin Fidel right now. I mean, we and buy cable news across the spectrum, but we also work with them to build partnerships. So it's not just a, a, a media buy. The partnership piece is, is critical because that really gets the, the most bang for your buck. When you're sitting down and you're having a conversation and you're brainstorming, you're understanding what the possibilities are. Um, it's much more effective than, than just a straight buy, in my opinion. Agreed. I think this is going to come in your wheelhouse, Will, and OTT. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I would say um, uh, we, we did probably in this conversation over index and think a lot more about display and banner ads or you know, text-based journalism, but uh, a big part of the media that is purchased on our platform is from the major broadcasters, the major uh, media companies who all have some news offerings and those are a part of it. I don't think I'm qualified to make an editorial judgment on their journalistic bona fides, <laughs> um, but but I do think uh, uh, w like just thinking back, and this has been my personal point of view, is that um, anytime you have massive technological changes, especially in the distribution of media, uh, it will disrupt and uh, uh, create different challenges and different questions and different sort of dialogues within society. That's like, that's always true. And I think we're on uh, uh, past an inflection point in dealing with how media and how uh, distribution of media has changed. And we're kind of like settling a little bit. Uh, it was a bit rocky there for a while. It got a little aggressive. Um, and so I, I think whenever you have the historical gatekeepers being called into question, the great thing about the internet was that it was very low barriers to entry. We got to hear from voices and perspectives we never would have had access to otherwise, and we got to do it at scale. The bad thing about the internet is that there are low barriers to entry. <laughs> And we get a lot of other perspectives that maybe we don't want to hear. And I think we're just reconciling a lot of change in a very compressed amount of time. And we're just starting to settle now. We are out of time, but I want to just, Mark, take on your two questions as quickly as I can with my perspective as someone who bought a lot of media in his career. You got to go where the audience is, right? And unfortunately today, the bias is becoming more extreme. The polarization is being stoked by extranational forces, to your point. But if you want to get your word out to the most valuable audiences, 
you gotta tolerate some bias. And the key point there is what level of bias will you tolerate? And CNN and MSNBC and even Fox have a journalistic foundation and a certain level of integrity about how they report the news that is different than you know Alex Jones and Infowars, for example. And and again, that's the business that Advance is in is helping you set the bias parameter that you're willing to tolerate to reach the right audience, but not over-index against the misinformation and disinformation. And so, you know, I think I, I think trust in news. The one thing I would add is, I don't know of any other industry that I can think of that was harangued for four years as the lamestream media and the lying press, you know, and the enemy of the people. I don't think we've ever seen that. And there are a lot of people in this country that, you know, follow the person in the White House regardless of what he or she might say. I say she optimistically. Um, but, you know, we, we have to recognize that this is hopefully a momentary speed bump that was fomented by a guy with an agenda that was being put forth in another country. Um, I'm trying to walk the line. Uh, and, and, and I think we can earn it back. I think the quality of every journalist I've ever met and spent time with and the integrity and the devotion to finding the truth will earn that trust back. And we just need to weather the storm. And I hope, I hope most people agree. So thank you, uh, panelists. Thank you, audience. <laughs>